Hi, my name is Chuck Watts. I serve as uh, general counsel for the Department of Transportation. And um, I'm here today to uh, just MC this uh, panel. Uh, it's going to be discussing some uh, really interesting stuff that I think you all enjoy talking about and engaging in. Uh, as a reminder, we encourage each of you to engage uh, with the speakers and ask questions throughout the uh, summit using our app. If you've not done so already, uh, please download the Crowd Compass Attendee Hub app in the App Store. Uh, once in the app, search for Transportation Summit and download the event. The app will provide you with uh, up to the minute agenda uh, for the full conference as well as uh, allow you to, uh, to network with other attendees and participate uh, in, interactive, in an interactive game. You also uh, can participate through social, mute, social media by using the hashtag uh, NC Transportation Summit. Hashtag NC Transportation Summit. I want to uh, ask uh, David and Dan to come up and tell us about uh, the amazing things the organizations are doing uh, to deliver some of the most exciting transportation plans and projects today uh, for us tomorrow. Uh, David Green focuses on large-scale planning and urban design projects for Perkins and Will Design Firm. He's been involved in hundreds of projects over the past 30 years focusing on issues of sustainable development, particularly the creation of health and research districts in urban areas. They received the uh, American Institute of Architects Atlanta Silver Medal in 2003 and the Georgia Bronze Medal in 2008. Uh, please help me uh, welcome David Green to the podium. Thanks and good afternoon. Actually, that's a weird introduction because this has nothing to do with that. Um, mostly what I'm doing now is planning stuff globally. Um, and in fact, one of the projects we're working on that I'll talk briefly about today, very briefly, because I have 10 minutes to go through this, um, is we're planning the entire country of Kuwait, among other projects, giant projects in China, the Middle East, um, North America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I only say this because transportation is such an integral part of what we're doing, but it's not just transportation. Um, and so I'm going to run through these slides fairly quickly, and I'm going to talk about two different things um, that have to do with the way we plan the world. And then uh, Dan's actually going to talk uh, more about the technology of, um, uh, of future transportation alternatives, but they're both tied directly together. So um, the world's coming close to ending, right? 1.5 degrees, it's going to be a huge problem, 2040. Um, we know that this is happening, and so when this has all started coming out, we started to think about this a, 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 um, a lot more, right? And the fundamental problem with the way we plan everything in the world right now is um, we figure out what demand is going to be, and then we provide capacity based on a per capita value. We do this in almost all transportation engineering. Every road that's built in this country, and unfortunately throughout the rest of the world, is how many people do we have, how many cars is that going to generate, how many lanes do we need, how are we going to make that happen. It's entirely backwards. But I can't stand up here and tell everybody that's involved in the transportation business um, that that's wrong. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at this relative to energy. And so when I'm talking to energy engineers, I talk about transport, right? And so normally what we do is, is we understand how much stuff we need, we understand how we respond to the best way to sort of get that distributed, and then we figure out how much, um, uh, how we can use that at the sort of local level. So our engineers right now are planning for the next 25 years of energy demand. Imagine in your mind that this is for uh, transportation, right? Um, Planning, planning energy demand for the next 25 years in Kuwait. They're using a per capita basis that's been in place for the last 25 years. Kuwait uses more energy than anybody else in the world per capita with the exception of five other countries. It's pretty bad. The best we can do in this scenario is a diminution program that drops at 1% per year. That's insane, right? So you all don't design power plants, but you know that's insane. So this is the way we do everything in the world right now for the most, for most, for the most part. A house needs 300 kilowatts, right? A power station provides 300 megawatts. This will give us a million houses. So if somebody wants to plan for a million, a million houses for a population of, of 5 million, we end up needing a power plant. And then when we want to double the population, what do we do? We simply add another power plant. This is absolutely the embedded strategy and, and methodology that we use. But if we flip this and we think about the most efficient way 
at the level of the user and then think about demand prior to supplying that demand and the draw on that demand, we can actually look at something like, for instance, right? It makes perfect sense, a house that only requires 150 kilowatts. If we do that and we have a single power plant that requires 300 megawatts, then we can get that additional area, right? That additional um, uh, 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 amount of development simply by reducing the demand that's pulled from each of these individual areas, right? And then if we want to double that, we want to get four million houses. And we're working on projects that are projecting four million houses right now, right? So this is not an abstract sort of idea. Um, we can look at something other than that power station, which has all kinds of problems, as a way to solve this problem. So does anybody in this room think that's a bad idea, right? No, okay, perfect. And then in the, in the more distant future, as we're planning 25, 30 years out, and we start to take these things offline, we can start to understand that we can supply all of this with an alternative energy source, which has a lot less environmental damage and a lot more environmental positive uh, outcomes. Nobody sitting in this room right now thinks that's a bad idea, right? But you understand that every highway that we're designing in this country, and by extension, unfortunately, every developing country in the world, does not do this. It does the exact opposite. And that's what gets us this in China. These things are being built right now, and they're being built using the engineering methodologies that we've given them, right, and in the United States. And they're continuing to be constructed. So if this is not a good methodology for the production of energy, why is it a good methodology for the production of roads, right? And unfortunately in this process, we've forgotten something, right? We've forgotten that there's a kind of framework that we can put in place to create the capacities that we need for things like transportation. And so we look at, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, but we look at Pennsylvania, right? Huge amount of capacity, uh, sorry, Philadelphia, huge amount of capacity, right? Super adaptable. Everything from corn to this was accommodated in the same framework, right? We never had to add any land capacity. We never had to add any additional um, infrastructure, horizontal infrastructure, to carry this incredible increase in capacity. And so from this, we have this sort of mantra that how we divide up our land is more important than what we do with it. And from that, we have this idea that how we manage land use is more important than we, what we, uh, how we project it. Along with capacity and demand modeling, the other thing that is incredibly problematic for the planning profession is land use. Land use from 1926, November 22nd, 1926 onwards, has been the singular problem because everything comes from land use projections and then um, uh, uh, demand modeling that's coming off those land uses, whether it's water, uh, uh, transportation capacity, energy capacity, and it's always peak demand, right? So the problem with land use, and think about it, every roadway you're designing is tied to demand modeling that's coming from land use projections. So project, land use, three different kinds of uses, break it up like this, three different experts come in, design three different things. We've got offices, right? We've got retail, we've got residential, right? This is what we end up with. If you don't believe me, it's 95% of the United States. It's 100% give or take, of the Middle East. It's 100% of uh, all the developments that have been put in place in, in China over the last 20 years, and we end up with this, right? This is what you get. It's inarguable, right? It is absolutely um, the, the, the situation that we find ourselves in, and the methodologies embedded in this are what are producing it. We end up with maps like this that tell us how we distribute land use, and then we tie it to all the different infrastructure and utilities requirements that we need. However, if we think about the way we built cities, and every place we live for the previous 2,500 years before the 1920s, we simply draw not roads, but streets. We put that in place. We figure out the size of these things initially. We have the same exact uses that we would show in the, in the previous uh, example. Um, and we set the same thing up. We have the same amount of parking. We have the same amount of green space. We have the same amount of everything. The fundamental difference here is that we can grow and change without having to change the underlying infrastructure and framework. It's entirely adaptable, right? And so in this, and we don't have to, 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 to believe or disbelieve this because we can look at places like Philadelphia and New York and we can look at places like Gwinnett County in Atlanta 
or most other suburbs in the, in the country and know that one thing has changed greatly over the last hundred years and another thing hasn't. And the only reason that's is because it's so much more difficult to change land use that's projected in large single-use areas. And so if you want to change that, you have to pull everything out of an entire area and start over. However, if you want to change the, 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 the thing that's got a framework in place, the sort of, the sort of street system, um, you don't have to worry about it. it. It's already embedded with a kind of adaptable framework. So you end up with what's on top of what's on bottom. And, 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 and people look at this and they say, yeah, well, it's just a lifestyle sort of choice, whatever, which maybe 25 years ago it was. But now there are real implications because the per capita use of utilities and infrastructure is significantly higher in the situation on the top than it is on the situation on the bottom. So, so the question you ask yourself rhetorically is why is everything we do almost exclusively in this country and by extension, and I can't overestimate or over, over uh, uh, um, describe this, why is it that it's so easy to do what's on the top and so hard to do what's on the bottom? There are almost no examples of this happening throughout the world. So we've actually taken the entire country of Kuwait, we've put a national ordinance over it, which allows us to go in and create a highly connected system, which also allows us to utilize an analytical process to understand every bit of utility, every bit of transport that's going into the entire country. And it was actually based on the land ordinance that we had in, in the United States that Thomas Jefferson came up with, with in 1785, which is, Dan said to me a couple of minutes ago, makes LA the next great connected transit uh, hub of the world. And it's simply taking this and understanding these impacts. And I'm not going to get too, too deep into this, but we've got a, an incredible sort of algorithmic system that, that supports all of this, that allows us to understand the impacts of, of sectoral um, discussions that are, being, uh, uh, that are being made as we develop cities, regions, towns, and what the impacts are across those sectors. And we all know that that pretty much doesn't happen. This includes um, uh, analyses of transit in different areas. And so it's a fundamental, a fundamental shift in the way you think about developing within this system. And again, I can't really explain the way we're planning an entire country in 10 minutes, but suffi suffice it to say, we're taking this idea and supplanting this idea, right? This is an idiotic way to plan the future. So this simply says, these are the uses that are going in. This is how much water we need, worst case scenario. This is how many lanes we need, worst case scenario. This is how much energy we need, worst case scenario. And it's almost impossible to change it because everything of one color is designed to be one thing and one thing only. So this is what the future plan of Kuwait looks like. If Kuwait can do it, and trust me, this is not the most progressive country in the world, it seems like a country like the United States should be able to do it. And because all of our decisions have outsized impact on the world, one might imagine that we should be even more careful about the way we think about these things. So I'm going to hand it back to Chuck, who's going to introduce Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, sure. Next we're going to have, that was great, and frankly, we've got more time, and you'll be able to go through some more details on that uh, after uh, we hear from uh, Dan Perez. Um, thank you, uh, David. Uh, as a trans planning and emerging uh, mobility associate at uh, Nelson Wagner, Dan Perez specializes in helping citizen cities and trans agencies work together to optimize streets and transit networks for the future of mobility. Uh, he projects, his projects have uh, reserved, reversed uh, ridership declines through bus networks, redesign, improved transit reliability with innovative strategies that might pop up bus lanes and foster collaboration between public and private mobility providers. Uh, please help me welcome Dan to Stay in the Imagine written by somebody else, and if it's not accurate, do the best you can. I wrote my and it was wrong. All right, um, so today we're here talking about designing for a future of unknowns, and in transportation, one of the most, or most important unknowns are autonomous vehicles. Over the past you know, decades, we've kind of had dreams of an autonomous future. And in the past couple of years, we've really started to see autonomous vehicles on the street, um, not in full autonomous mode, but with uh, 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 driver-assisted autonomous vehicles as well as uh, vehicles with safety managers. Uh, but over the next few years, we expect that we'll have more, a higher level of autonomy, and then 
potentially in the near future or in the next couple of decades we'll have full autonomous vehicles on the road and because of that we're starting to see people make really really big predictions and tell a really big story about what the world with autonomous vehicles will be like the story kind of goes like this first autonomous vehicles will end private car ownership um, the cost of using an autonomous vehicle versus owning your own um, owning your own car um, will make it so that it just doesn't make sense to own a private car. You'll you'll be uh, hailing a vehicle, using that vehicle for a certain amount of time, and then someone else will use that vehicle. Um, you might even share your ride with someone else, and that trip might be uh, at cost as little as nothing. We're starting to see pilots where uh, companies like Walmart are uh, essentially paying for a ride because it allows them to capture a customer with a lower uh, customer acquisition cost than traditional marketing. <coughs> And this is great, sorry, uh, this is great because right now cars aren't used 95% of the time and if we move to a shared autonomous world, uh, we'll be able to use our resources more efficiently. It will also allow us to do things like eliminate the need for street and downtown parking. Uh, if, uh, if cars um, are being used more regularly, you won't need to park them as much and if cars are autonomous, they'll be able to take themselves to some remote location away from downtown and not on the street, and we won't have to worry about that anymore. The story continues by saying that public transit will become obsolete. Um, uh, public transit ridership has gone down a lot in the past few years, and uh, a lot of people attribute that to the rise of Uber and Lyft, um, and essentially providing that autonomous experience uh, for the customer. Y yes, you're being driven by a human, but you don't need to park anymore. Uh, you don't need to worry about what's gonna happen to the vehicle before and after, so, um, people are projecting that future into a world of autonomous vehicles where uh, people, where, where folks will just hail a ride, they might share with a few people, but they won't need public transit anymore, so that's not invest. Pivoting a little bit, the story continues that autonomous vehicles will transform logistics. Um, probably the first stage of that would be long-haul trucking, and then in the future we might have kind of micro delivery services where you can get a pizza delivered by an autonomous vehicle. Um, the autonomous vehicle will come and deliver your groceries, or your one hour um, uh, package delivery. And we're already starting to see this type of service being uh, piloted. Uh, companies like Ford and Domino's are trying to see how far someone might be willing to walk to meet their autonomous pizza. Um, and then finally, all of this will happen while dramatically reducing congestion. Autonomous vehicle tests have shown that just a few autonomous vehicles, or, or uh, uh, simulations have shown that just a few autonomous vehicles can uh, uh, increase traffic flow on highways, and, and a lot of folks have kind of projected that out to just that we don't need to really worry about congestion in our cities because autonomous vehicles will cure that problem. And I kind of hate to break it to you, but a lot of the a lot of this story requires a fundamental rethinking of the basics of geometry and the basics of uh, transportation engineering uh, or uh, uh, transportation economics just because vehicles are autonomous doesn't mean that people will just magically uh, overnight start using um, the roads and vehicles in a completely different way um, I think there are a few ways to illustrate this point kind of why autonomy doesn't necessarily uh, have to follow this story that uh, a lot of folks have been uh, putting forward so first is just basic induced demand. The way that we, uh, as David was kind of talking about earlier, the way that we kind of do transportation planning um, in the US is we have congestion, people really, really hate that. Um, so we start and we say, okay, well let's widen the road, we need to expand capacity to meet demand. Um, we do that, we cause faster driving, everyone's happy for a little bit. But then more people start driving and we start having congestion again and this process just keeps going over and over and over again. Uh, there's no reason why this isn't going to be the same story once autonomous vehicles um, have some minimal or have some capacity benefits. So autonomous vehicles come in, we start being able to do platoons, we uh, start having uh, a little bit more space on our roads because we can dedicate our curb space in different ways. People can drive a little bit faster. Also the cost of driving is going way down so people want to consume more of it and then more people start driving, and then congestion happens, and then those benefits kind of go away over time, and we end up in the same situation where we are now with crap, clogged streets, lots of congestion. 
Another way to think about it is how um, road space is used among different kinds of vehicles. When you're in a uh, single occupancy car, you're taking up 10 times as much space as someone who's riding a bus or walking or using a bicycle. And so roads where, where uh, single occupancy cars are the predominant way people are traveling are just inherently less efficient than a, uh, a road that has a mix of people on transit and on uh, uh, using active modes like walking and biking. And that story is gonna be the same um, with ride handling with autonomous vehicles. A ride handling vehicle where you are a single passenger with a driver or a ride or an autonomous vehicle where you're being driven around by a robot are going to be exactly the same, um, take up exactly the same amount of space. And we may be able to uh, use pricing to encourage people uh, to share autonomous vehicles and Uber and Lyft have already experimented with pooling services that encourage people to uh, uh, share trips. Um, but with autonomous vehicles, you're still taking up the same amount of space and we're adding a bunch of new entrants into the market. Your autonomous pizza takes up space, your autonomous Amazon box takes up space, your car that's empty, that's driving to your parking lot, it also takes up space. And so the idea that we're gonna be able to have all of those things while keeping the status quo just by introducing autonomy, it just doesn't make sense. So I think one lesson to take away from today is that we need to focus on creating places that allow people to move around and that it change the focus from moving people or moving vehicles to moving people and creating um, both the physical and regulatory environment um, that supports just moving as many people as possible um, and supporting community values. And ride handling companies already understand this. There's a great quote from the CEO of Uber um, where he basically said, during rush hour, it's very inefficient for, to move a one-ton hulk of metal to take one person 10 blocks. They understand that their business model doesn't make sense um, in dense urban environments. It doesn't make sense for every single person to be in their own car, even if you're able to eke out a little bit more capacity benefits with autonomous vehicles. So Uber and Lyft are now investing in micro-mobility services like bike sharing and scooter sharing, and Lyft even makes it so that you can um, view transit options in their app, and it will tell you if transit um, in some markets is a better option than using a service that they receive money for. Um, and they understand that in order for their services to make sense, they have to support moving as many people as possible, regardless of what mode they choose to use. I think one other thing that's really important when talking about autonomous vehicles is that it's not a certainty. We don't know exactly when fully autonomous vehicles will come to market and how widespread that adoption will be. And thus, when we're designing for that unknown future, we have to focus on what matters both today and what will continue to matter when autonomous vehicles um, uh, enter the market. I think, uh, so I'm gonna go through and talk about some of those things that you can start doing, doing today um, to prepare for autonomous vehicles while also uh, benefiting the cities and communities that you live in, work in. So the first, I think, uh, and most important, is that you develop a lens to make transportation decisions through. Instead of reacting to kind of the latest congestion and parking problem, it's important to develop mobility policies that reflect your community values. Um, some of those will be very mobility focused, but they often connect mobility to a broader value. So the city of Pittsburgh is doing a really great job. Um, they laid out some extremely clear goals around mobility. Um, one of which I think is a great example is that everyone should be within a 10 minute walk of um, a, a place that they can buy fresh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so they should be able to access that without a car. Um, and they can make, now they can uh, develop transportation uh, projects that fill in those gaps. And they're not just improving the road um, or making transit better, but they're actually making transit better towards a broader community purpose. Now with that lens, you can start thinking about the broader uh, issues that will affect, that affect your community today and will be important with autonomous vehicles. The most important is managing the street and managing curb space. Autonomous vehicles uh, will likely have a, a larger element of sharing and people will not be parking uh, directly in front of the places that they're uh, visiting. And thus curb space and street space becomes extremely important to manage. Uh, Salida Reynolds, the head of LADOT, had a really interesting comment a few days ago where she said, imagine um, your local airport when you're thinking about what autonomous the future of autonomous vehicles could look like, a curb space with an extremely high demand 
that isn't managed at all just doesn't work. You end up with tons of traffic, tons of people pulling in and out, waiting, um, and just total mismanagement. So we can use regulations and dividing up street space um, as one way to manage the street, manage the curb. But it's also really important to start thinking about pricing, um, and especially pricing wasted space. Um, so with autonomous vehicles, there's the ability for the cars to essentially drive around endlessly forever without people in them. Um, you could see people using that to avoid paying for parking. You could see even a world where people live in autonomous vehicles because it's cheaper than, the, than uh, uh, owning an apartment. Um, so it's really important to start thinking about pricing wasted space to achieve the mobility goals of your community and to stop things like, you know, kind of endless mobile advertisements and, and other things that, that uh, replace space that should be used for moving people just to move vehicles. Another kind of short-term uh, thing that uh, cities can focus on is uh, reforming your parking design and regulations. Parking demand is already going down in cities as um, uh, services like Uber and Lyft become more popular. Uh, the economics of developing parking are changing, and most cities still force developers to build unnecessary and, and often going unused parking facilities that increase the cost of commercial rents and increase uh, residential housing costs. And it just doesn't make sense as we move towards a more autonomous future to continue on um, that current uh, paradigm. In cities, it's extremely important to start thinking about how to use your street to move more people through transit. Um, uh, Wake County has done a really good job in this through their sales tax initiative, building a frequent transit network that will make it so a high percentage of people who live in the county, especially in the urban area, can walk outside their door and get to a transit service that operates every 15 minutes. It gives a great base for building a mobility network that moves more people. And if you can do things like dedicating road space to make a congestion-free alternative, as we go through the transition towards autonomy, um, uh, you'll have people be able to choose an alternative where they don't have to worry about congestion as we start using pricing to you know, uh, make the general lanes function more, there'll always be a frequent and congestion-free alternative with transit. Same with active transportation, so walking and biking and uh, scooters and dockless bike share are all really important because they simply are more efficient ways of moving people. Um, so creating uh, active transportation uh, facilities that enable someone to carry their daughter in groceries and not really worry about the safety or speed impl implications of that is you know, a, a goal that cities should really be striving for. And that will be important whether autonomous vehicles are 10 years out or 15 or 30 years out. And then the last point is just a, a lot of cities and uh, states and transit agencies today really focus on the provision of service. We build a street, we run a bus, um, but we don't really think about you know, the complete trip that someone is making with that and how they're using it. And there's a lot of focus on well, what's the ridership on my service or are people using my streets? And it's really important for transit agencies and cities to start working together more and thinking more about kind of the whole mobility from door to door um, and not and worry less about, you know, are our services moving people, but more uh, um, about are, are our services able to integrate seamlessly so that people can create a trip um, that works for them for a given situation from beginning to end. Um, so thanks, everyone.
through a kind of planning process, we, we were able to, um, sorry, I'll just go stand up here. <laughs> So, so from a planning process, think about this. We were, we're God, I got to tell you, man, it's like working with all, you know. So we were working with teams that have like 20 different engineer, engineering sectors, and trying to balance all this stuff is almost impossible. So we were looking at things like um, peak demand. So right now, most countries are, are generating energy that's based on um, kind of peak demand, peak demand plus um, uh, uh, additional margin of safety. So. You know, apart from an hour a day, you're generating 60, 70 percent more energy than you need. And the reason that that's a problem is because you end up with multiple peaks across a 24-hour period because you get office areas that are generating peak demand, and those are being served by substations. You didn't realize you're going to be talking about substations in a transportation discussion, but you're putting substations in place that are only supplying power for that uh, uh, for that office park, for instance. And then you've got another one that's, that's supplying power. And peak demand in the winter time might be 10 o'clock at night for a, for a residential subdivision. And so you're setting the worst case scenario across the board. So what we've been able to do is go back in and evaluate. And this is the grid system that we set up, which goes all the way down to 150 meter cell. And we can disaggregate all the information that we're getting, the, the, the usage quanta, um, and re-aggregate that, in this case, based on the, the co-locating of um, substations so that we're balancing the amount of power needed for what's planned for residential and what's planned for um, office and whatever else the uses are at the initial planning level so that we can actually see significant reductions. But the power company, in this case it's the Ministry of Electricity and Water, has no way of knowing this because they're not working with the Public Authority for Housing Welfare, it's a long story. Um, and so they're, it, it's so much easier for the engineers just to say, okay, I've got a thing, this is how much it's gonna take. I'm going to go put. Uh, I'm going to supply this uh, based on these criteria. But if you start thinking about, so we've got this incredibly sort of complex matrix that takes 20 different engineering sectors and planning sectors and evaluates these on a sector by sector basis, and then rolls up the impact, the resource impact, the economic impact, and interestingly enough, the connectivity impact and the cultural impact, um, and, and and can then spit out. That sounds kind of like a bad thing to say, but it then gives you outputs that tell you as you're managing these situations, right, how you can get the highest level of return in each of these areas. Um, we're work it's interesting, we're working with Siemens on a lot of the technology that we're putting in place for this, um, and we're doing it in crazy places like Istanbul, right, which seems overly complex to be able to deal with a situation like this, but that's, that's what we can do, right, and that's what I think we should be doing, and all it does is it daylights the disconnects between the planning process and the outcomes that we're getting. Does that make sense? It does. And the decision makers understand the output and if you use it to help people understand Only to the, so this was critical. We came up with these, evalu <laughs> we have these evaluation sheets that break everything down. So we had to look at scenarios. So in the case of Kuwait, we looked at a scenario for four different uh, options. Nobody cares about all the internal, like they don't, nobody that, that's in parliament cares about all the outcomes, all they cared about was the grade that we gave each each of the different scenarios. And so we were very clearly able to say that scenario four was the preferred option because it fulfilled all of these goals that we had in place and reduced resource utilization, et cetera, et cetera, and got a grade of 96, as opposed to a more distributed system, which was what was being done previously, that got a grade of 77. And unless you break it down to that level of simplicity, you can't get the politicians that aren't trained in these areas to understand that. Otherwise, it's just a, a series of rabbit holes.
concept um, that relates to your question that uh, is kind of be explored more in planning is traditionally we've looked at you know, general travel lanes and sidewalks and bike lanes um, and sometimes bus lanes in you know very specific uh, lanes that are designed either for the general uh, population or for a very specific mode. And one concept that's been put forward is to start designing lanes based on speed, um, especially because scooters kind of are in between a bike and a car in terms of their, you know, a, a speed that people can go, uh, you know, I think right now they're regulated to about 15 miles an hour. It's a little bit faster than folks will do on a bike. Um, so in the example of uh, horses, you could see a world where we have kind of a slow lane that's for people uh, biking or for uh, people walking and for inexperienced um, and younger bike riders and a medium speed lane that's for advanced bike riders and for scooters and then higher speed lanes for transit and, uh, and, and um, uh, general cars and autonomous vehicles. So I think part of the, the shift towards micro-mobility and autonomous vehicles, we have to start thinking a little bit differently about how we design our streets uh, based on uh, for speed and safety considerations, while also understanding that the streets that are most successful are often the streets where all those things end up mixed. Um, so, you know, we don't want to segment things too much, but it also safety is important, um, and also in, you know ensuring that people are able to go the, the right speed on the vehicles they're using. Uh, I want to make one comment about that. This just that uh, you know, as we plan to try to get to this vision in the future, um, and this is really what we wanted to talk about to some extent in this session. Um, this is the, the things that we know, so like what Don Rumsfeld is called the knowns, the, the known unknowns, and the unknown knowns, and so forth. But there's a lot of things that we know, and a lot of things that we don't know, and we don't even know that we don't know. Them. Um, how these, and most of that happens in the period between sort of full actualization of autonomous driving and where we are today. So we have these mixed modes that you're sort of describing as chaotic. You're right, there's going to be a lot of planning. Um, in order to have the benefits of autonomous communicating vehicles, you know, you have to have lanes where they can, you know, communicate and be autonomous and go closer together. Otherwise, they probably at the beginning are going to take further, more space because uh, in order for people to feel comfortable that a machine is driving, it needs more space between it and the next car. It'll be a long time before we get comfortable enough for it to be close. So stay tuned. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Yes? Um, I really enjoyed the points uh, that was made about um, adaptive uh, design. <coughs> and you know, I, can, you know, I see how it works in Philadelphia, how it works in you know, New York. Um, you know, have you had any, you know, any experience with, um, with retrofitting, you know, some of the um, oh, yeah. difficult design that we have pumped out here in America Absolutely. in land use and transportation, you know, towards adaptable design? That's a great question. Why don't you repeat the question? I'm going to repeat the question. The question was, all the ideas, like New York is great, you know, um, Philadelphia is great, but if you had any experience with retrofitting, this, there's this whole thing. So Ellen Dunham Jones is a really good friend of mine. I talked with her for a long time. She wrote this book called Retrofitting Suburbia, right? It's a lot of case studies, but it doesn't really tell you exactly how to do this. And, it, and it's a challenge. And so we've done this in a number of different places. But the problem is the legal system is set up in such a way that it makes it almost impossible. So we've got a cul-de-sac, for instance, and you all hear this again and again. In most places, it's illegal to extend that cul-de-sac. So, so in order to get the connectivity you need, you're, you're not up against a kind of design situation, you're up against a legal situation. And there's this kind of fallacy of safety in that situation because the data is actually being used in a way that's inaccurate to demonstrate a, a condition that people want to, use, want to keep the same, right? It has all, a lot to do with the individual collective relationship. Anyway, so what we've been able to do is run these analytics on connectivity. And so when I was talking about those sorts of issues, we can dispassionately understand the level of connectivity in an entire system. And so instead of thinking about it as a grid, you think of, about it as a sort of web. So the fact that streets are curved and end is absolutely not a reason that you can't go in and retrofit these things. It's more difficult to do, certainly. And it's impossible to do it um, with a shopping mall or a giant business park in most cases. Um, but it allows you to understand the level and the, 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 the resource cost at which you can create a level of connectivity that aligns with certain other parts of the, um, uh, certain other urban development uh, structures. 
But without that, it, it's really impossible to know how much, and this is a big deal, right, how much you're going to spend retrofitting that. Because unless you can reduce the basis in land enough so that it generates future development, it's simply not going to work. Um, and so we are seeing these happen, but primarily they're in places with two conditions. One is where you've got large super blocks where you can go in and you can create connections across those super blocks. Super blocks are a horrible thing, notwithstanding Barcelona. Don't ever put a super block in. It's insane, right? Um, and then the other situation where we can do this is, and this is an, you probably don't see this very much, but globally it's pervasive where you've got blocks that might be a kilometer by a kilometer that are super well connected internally and actually have connections to the external uh, edge conditions, but they're all uh, disconnected arterials or grade separated highways. And so then you can go in and very cleanly pick up where you can create connections across block, across block. Phoenix is a great example. Quarter sections, a quarter mile by a quarter mile, you've got two ways in and two ways out. But internally it might be very well connected and create a much larger connection. You're, they're going to have the same problem in Los Angeles with this. So yes, it's possible, but the key to all of this is understanding the degree to which you have to put resources in to change it. And in many cases, it's simpler to let nature take it back over or scrape it and start from scratch. So there's a, a couple of different ways to approach that. Uh, one is that um, some cities are beginning to regulate just basic usage statistics um, and safety statistics around micromobility. Um, there's also a few cities that are um, uh, putting forward a data standard um, so that uh, we can start thinking about how uh, micromobility is being used and its benefits and costs um, in a standardized way that you can compare across different cities. Um, we're still really at the infancy of a lot of these scooter services. In most cities, they've only been around for, um, I, I'm from the Northeast, so we often think in seasons. Um, so they've only really been around for one season. We're about to have winter, they're gonna come back. Um, so I think that uh, we're still, it, it's gonna take a while to develop the strong data um, to support both the safety and what conditions we need to make in order to ensure that they're safe. Um, understanding that we, Operated transit a transportation system that is already killing you know thirty to forty thousand people a year, um, and that scooters are have safety impl implications, but there's also a broader safety implication. Um, but then also understanding usage, we're starting to see in a lot of cities that the initial data that we're getting is that scooters are much more are used much more frequently than uh, bikes um, or the dockless bike share that some cities have. Um, so there's a lot of positive indicators that are coming out of that, but I think the conversation around scooters are just is just beginning, and the data that we need to fully understand how people use them, um, their safety implications, how people use them um, as kind of <coughs> full trip um, services versus uh, connecting to other mobility services. We're we're still there's a lot of work to do there. So. question was policy changes both for land use and for autonomous vehicles. 
So one thing I'm going to throw out there before I answer the question is I would love for one person in this audience to give me one reason why scooters are a bad idea. I firmly believe that they're absolutely great and there's no reason we shouldn't have lots more of them. And so I would challenge somebody in the audience after Dan's finished to tell us, tell me one thing and I'll tell you why you're wrong, okay? So um, the thing about, so what we've done, there's a really interesting thing that got put in place in the 1920s when zoning was put in place, it was called the City Planning Enabling Act. And the federal government, the Hoover Commission in 1928, actually told jurisdictions at a national level, enabled them to, to put planning in place as a, as a legal entity, that the first thing they had to do was project public rights of way. And then the second thing that you would do, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, 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 shortening this a bit, was then you figured out what the uses were that went within these, these sort of you know, residual spaces, which we understand as blocks, right, developable areas. And so what we've started doing now is putting policies in place that reflect what was originally essentially the codification of the way we built cities for millennia, and we're actually removing land use from the regulatory process. Now, I will say this has been much easier to do in other countries than it has in the United States, because as you say, it is incredibly embedded in the process because there's an embedded methodology where everything comes from land use, right? The amount of traffic, the amount of energy, the amount of water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're trying to do in this process is change policy so that it's based on, and I hate to use this word, but it's based on performance instead of uh, projection. And this is why how, this is why the, the idea that land use should be used as a management tool and not a projection tool is critical. And we're starting to see changes in these areas globally. Although, to be honest, maybe 1% of the development in the world is based on this scenario. And remember that prior to 1930, 100% of development was based on this scenario. So every city that you go to that you love didn't have anything to do with land use, right? Sorry. side, I think there are a few cities that have done a really good job um, exploring new mobility strategies and then uh, kind of codifying them in, in published documents. So Seattle created a new mobility playbook um, that's kind of become a standard that a lot of agencies have looked at where they basically just look at kind of the future of mobility, the types of services that might be offered, and have developed a framework for how the city would react and plan for them. Um, I think in this space, uh, a lot of cities have been really successful in implementing pilot uh, policies or pilot uh, programs and some of the projects that I've worked on are you know, just trying something out and seeing if it works and developing an analytical framework for evaluating whether it's working or not and if it does work, kind of continuing and moving forward. If it doesn't, taking a step back and evaluating. I think a lot of the space, a lot of this space is going to be done through kind of iterative, you know, trying something out, see if it works. Um, and then developing policies that reflect uh, the, how you, basically the findings of your evaluations. Um, but definitely, as, as cities explore pilots, it's important to set a clear framework for what, if a pilot is working, how you're gonna continue uh, with the policy so that pilots don't become kind of a cycle where you can you know, react to, to the new thing and then find a way to kind of shut it down. It's important that if it's working to continue to move forward and develop policy um, around it. Other questions? You know, Dan, you mentioned um, uh, trying to reduce the amount of parking per square foot requirements and so forth. I know, uh, and uh, David, you talked about the uh, elimination of uh, super blocks, and I think what came to mind to me was Tyson, Virginia, and, and the changes they're doing there. Um, what, one of the challenges, however, when it comes to making those kind of changes is that it's not necessarily the rules that require you to do that, but it's financing sometimes. How do we get around? Yeah, so, I'm sorry, I, I don't disagree with that at all. So, but this is the thing, right? So I started my career doing adaptive reuse projects, and when we started this, there was no financial mechanism that allowed you to get a loan that had mixed use in a building, right? Everything was, and so, so, so over the, the, like somebody who's 25 years old can't even imagine that because everything that gets that gets developed has a financial instrument now that allows that mix to happen. The difficulty in our profession is that we're we're asking questions like that that have to do with trying to solve a problem the next year when we're facing problems that were the result of things that were decided 40 or 50 years ago. So we need to think about a way to make those modifications not for us, 
right? But for children and grandchildren, because the financial, the financial mechanisms aren't going to change overnight. But the other thing that they do, which is phenomenal, is they adapt. What they really care about is consistency and level playing fields, right? And so if you set this up, so do you know what the most expensive retail space in uh, the state of Georgia is? It's the small shops on Broughton Avenue in Savannah. You know how much parking they have? Zero. But they have Savannah, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard. But what alternative do you have, right? Somebody sat around 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago in our situation and made the exact same decisions, and we're living with those decisions. And so I always try to ask myself not why we can't do something, but how we can actually make it happen, right? Yeah, that was really my question. How, how can we make that happen? <laughs> So I can tell you exactly how we changed the financial mechanism in Atlanta, right? It, it, and it was phenomenal. We, There was a guy who was enlightened enough and rich enough to write a check to get a personal loan to build a mixed-use loft development. And it worked, right? And everybody then looked at that as a model, and the market forced the changes in the financial instruments that were used to finance projects. And so it's almost impossible. So it's almost impossible to make broad sweeping policy changes on, a, on, a, on, a, on an individual project by project basis. So you have to be sort of tactical about it. So I know this sounds crazy, but the reason we're spending all this time in this little country in the Middle East called Kuwait is because if we can get one full country to adopt this system, which we're in the process of doing, it then becomes um, evidence that it's possible, right? And this is a country that has the highest per capita use uh, 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 solid waste use in the world, right? I mean, what other choice do you have? Nobody's, we can't be Thomas Jefferson again, right? So it has to be done on an incremental, an incremental basis. And so Tyson's Corner was, was done as a project that demonstrated that people see that it works. You know, the, the closing of, the, one of the great experiments of the last 20 years was the closing of Broadway, right? It was done with paint and bollards that could be removed if it didn't work. And it turned out that, in, in fact, it didn't cause additional congestion. It reduced congestion, right? But if that little target project hadn't been done, nobody would have ever realized that because everybody thinks that putting, putting less access for cars is going to cause congestion. And this stuff is counterintuitive sometimes, and you have to try to put it in place. So you have to find some rich people that are enlightened. You have to find some governments that are enlightened. And you have to test this stuff. It's what we've done for our entire history. Did anybody ever come up with a reason that the scooters are bad? Yeah. Yeah, so what do you say? So let me just say this. This is a great example, alcohol, right? So would you rather have somebody tooling down Main Street on a scooter after about nine gin and tonics or sitting in their Mustang, right? You, 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 if that's the logic, then we should get rid of every car on the road, right? Yes, sir. Ride in the road and compete with cars, or do they ride on the sidewalk? Who cares? So if they, so then, so, so, so then, so, but that's. Oh, sorry. The question was, should they ride on the road or ride on the sidewalk? So, so then you go back to speed. So I live in London, right? And the bikers all hate me because I walk, and the taxi drivers, but the drivers all hate the bikers and me, and then the taxi drivers hate everybody, right? And so there's this hierarchy. And right now, every decision we make, it, every decision we make, I don't care what anybody tells you, is based on fluid movement of automobiles. And so everything that we come up with that says we don't like scooters is because it can either be justified um, as an analogy for automobiles, and we should look at the automobile the same way, or we should suppress the presence of the automobile for the benefit of the scooter. So every time we've got two lanes for cars, we should lose one of those lanes and make it a scooter lane, right? Why not? They use less energy, They're, uh, they kill fewer people. So that's never going to happen, right? But, but what it makes you realize is that the rationality of the discussions we're in completely ceases to exist when we talk about automobiles and capacity for automotive transportation, right? In no other planning area is it less rational than it is with automobiles, right? So is there any, sorry, yeah. 
So a absolutely. So more people die in cars, so you should put helmets on people in cars, right? <laughs> so let me, so, I'm sorry? So, probably not, right? But you're going much slower, right? The, the, the idea is that, that scooters are less dangerous overall, right? I mean, we unfortunately live in a country where you can ride motorcycles in a lot of states without a helmet, which is completely idiotic. So yeah, maybe, so this is an interesting fact about the helmets, right? Maybe you should make people wear helmets, but as a public health issue, it's actually better to not require helmets for bike riders in urban areas than it is to require helmets. And the reason for that is because the individual incidence of head trauma is so much outweighed by the benefits to all other chronic health issues for people that ride bikes that on average, across the board, statistically, bikes are better for us in terms of health if we don't have helmets. The reason is more people ride bikes if you don't make them wear a helmet. These things are counterintuitive, but we look at all these decisions from a personal individual level, right? So again, is there any reason? But, but people are furious across the country about these crazy scooters right now. And it's primarily because they don't look nice when they clog the sidewalks, right? Yeah, big deal, you know, go spend some time in the Moray in Paris if you want to talk about clogged sidewalks, but it works pretty well and there are lots of people and it's really, really expensive or because they're getting in the way of cars. The cars aren't getting in the way of the scooters. The scooters are getting in the way of cars. And until we change that perspective, I mean, we're so far, so far from, I think the woman back there was talking about Izmir, Turkey, if I heard her correctly. We're so far from the model of the most progressive multimodal places in the world that we can't, <laughs> we can't just make these tiny incremental changes. And that's why I actually started with the slide that showed the shift from 2.3 to 1.5 degrees, right? Because I think if we don't make some of these decisions, and I'll be dead, right? I don't care. And I don't have any kids. I've got some cats and my wife, but she's as old as I am, right? We're going to have problems, right? And it's either going to be solutions of our making or we're just going to have to start over. And I'm not really sure how you do that. Yeah, by the way, I around the Yeah, probably. Listen, I want to say thanks to David and Dan for being here and thank you all for coming and engaging.